Uh, let's get a little bit more on the president's speech and bring in our Bloomberg Washington correspondent, Amory Hordern, who's been listening to all of the details there. Amory, uh, your thoughts, let's go back to where he started, which was, of course, on the jobs picture. He painted what we're seeing now as a more steady jobs picture after mm -hmm. a few months that were really booming post-pandemic recovery. Now something more steady. I was going to ask you before we heard from the president, how is a presidency going to set the tone for a labour market that might that might come off the boil a little bit? Well, I guess we heard him doing that there. Yeah, we did. And, and this is really just echoes what he said uh, earlier in the week with this Wall Street Journal opinion piece. And this is the, really the administration now focusing on the fact that a lot of attention and energy is going to be put into bringing consumer prices down. Um, it's a very difficult moment for the president, right? Because what you're seeing in this robust jobs report, another one we had in May, and what we have seen over the course of the past few months is that this signals a very healthy, stable economy at the labor market. But politically, when you look at the polls, people are not feeling other people getting jobs, clearly. What they are feeling is prices going up. And the president hand, uh, said that right at the top. He said, yes, it's a good jobs report. Yes, this is excellent. But I know that a lot of Americans are anxious, and they're worried about their grocery bills, and they're worried about their gasoline prices. He did put the finger a little bit on Congress. He wants them to pass these clean energy tax incentives. He says that people say, CEOs say this could bring down utility bills. So he's looking for other ways to bring down prices mm -hmm. if he knows, and he said, we're going to be dealing with elevated gasoline and grocery bills. Yeah, Emory, I was really interested in that. And he says, you know, we're going to do everything to control price hikes. I was just talking to Mike Wirt, the Chevron CEO, and I asked him if the administration has called him, and he, he said no. He said, I'm assuming I'll talk to them when I'm in Washington. But that, to me, would be the first phone call. Can you give me some insight into the administration's thinking when it comes to the oil industry? Well, U.S. officials I talked to have been saying that they expect by the end of the year production in America to go up. Producers are putting more money in, and they will have higher production. And part of the reason to tap the SPR was to try to get to that level towards the end of the year. I listened to that interview, and I heard Mike Wirtz say he's going to be in D.C. next week. Um, I imagine people on his team have been in contact with people in the administration. I know this was a huge rallying call at Sarah Week, especially from Granholm, the Secretary of Energy, saying, please start drilling again. This is a wartime effort. But it's a difficult situation because there's only so much oil in the world, and that is only part of the problem, as you know, Alex. I know you really dived into that with Mike Wirth there. Part of the problem is we need more oil. Maybe OPEC is starting to open up, or Saudi Arabia is starting to open up to acquiesce to the U.S. calls for that. They've been calling since last August for that. And the other part is, of course, the refining capacity, turning that oil into actual everyday products. And right now, that is where the stress is. Those margins are at records. And that is why every day American consumers are waking up today, another fresh record, $4.76 per gallon. That is the number mm -hmm. that White House Chief of Staff Ron Klain and every other advisor is looking at because this is the issue that could potentially tip what they have right now, a majority in Congress in November, potentially at least the House, maybe the Senate, Republican. Yeah, and you have to wonder, too, when you get to hurricane season, also that's just going to be more issues when it more comes pressures. to the product market, for sure. Um, Anne-Marie, thanks a lot. Really appreciate the instant analysis. Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern joining us there. Let's get a check in here on the markets. We are rolling over here around the lows of the session. The Nasdaq 100 now off by almost a full three percentage points. Yields moving higher here. Let's get a deeper breakdown with Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Hey, Abigail. Hey, Alex. Well, yes, a very bearish day here at this point. We're at session lows for stocks. The S&P 500 down 1.8 percent. The tech heavy Nasdaq down even more, down 2.9 percent. Some of this, of course, has to do with the jobs report, probably a solid report seen as a better than expected report. So similar to the I ISM report, this could mean that bad news is, or good news is bad news again, because the Fed may not be able to be flexible later in this year. They may have to be very aggressive with their hiking. So stocks down, plus those comments from Elon Musk uh, about a super bad feeling about the economy, that they may be uh, laying off 10% of their workforce. That's what's really weighing even more so in that NASDAQ 100 and the bigger weighting. Now, relative to all of this, not surprisingly, with that inflationary concern coming out of the jobs report, to some degree, you see the two-year yield backing up three basis points right along with it the dollar uh, up the Bloomberg dollar up index up about three tenths of one percent and that Anna of course is an issue because yesterday Microsoft pre-announced the downside for the current current quarter on FX uh, headwinds if that continues that could be a big problem for a lot of the multinational corporations Anna bearish day today Abigail
Thank you very much, Abigail Doolittle, on the markets, giving us an important update. Uh, 15 minutes away from the close of European equity markets, but there is, uh, of course, a lot to say about what's going on in the U.S. today. European stocks down three-tenths of a percent, uh, but U.S. stocks, as Abigail's just been going through, really being hit today. Let's get to Art Hogan, who uh, joins us now. B. Riley, National Securities Chief Market Strategist. Art, really nice to have you with us. So we heard from uh, Elon Musk. He has a super bad feeling about the uh, U.S. economy. President Biden clearly does not. Do you have a super bad feeling about the economy? No, I don't. And, you know, it's interesting. It seems to be a popular uh, thing this week to be predicting a recession, whether you're Jamie Dimon and seeing hurricanes coming or Elon Musk with a super bad feeling. And I think if you look at the data instead of look at what how you're feeling or what you're contemplating, and, and for example, if you look at Microsoft and Salesforce this week, they talked about having to take their numbers down because of a currency translation. It's not a demand issue, and I think that continues to be the case. Mm -hmm. Demand continues to outpace supply for both goods and services. I think that'll be reflective of, of the economic data we see for the, the rest of this uh, month. And I think that that's where the focus should be. When we look at you know a, a jobs report and we see the unemployment rate at 3.6 percent and the economy able to create 390,000 jobs, I think it, we're just in a place where you're, you're not seeing the glasses half full and you should. And I, and I believe investors are starting to slowly get around to that concept. Mm -hmm. I think, unfortunately, in a monetary policy tightening cycle, news can be too good. And I think that's today's knee-jerk reaction to the jobs number, very much like the ISM number that came out earlier in the week. But I think you really have to focus on the internals of that report and say, <clears throat> did uh, the unemployment rate go down? No, it stayed the same. Was this less than 400,000, which we saw for the last two months? Yes, that's good. So sequential improvement, moderating. And I think that the, when you look at the wages, the sequential increase has started to taper back down. And I think all of that is more good news than bad news in that economic data. But I certainly don't see... Uh, I don't have a super bad feeling about the uh, the economy in the in the in the weeks ahead. Hey Art, it's great to see you. It's been a minute. Uh, it's great to chat with you. Um, I just want to bring in this sort of echoes what you're saying. Uh, Jane Frazier is speaking at a conference, CEO of City, and she has some interesting things to say. She says the U.S. probably can't avoid a recession, but that the consumer is really healthy. They have a lot of money in their wallets. They are starting to borrow some money again. That sort of sits with your glass half full scenario. When does that scenario become your glass half empty? And how does that translate into any asset rotation? You know, it's interesting, and you bring up really good points, but we're going through a normalization of consumption patterns right now. We're all seeing it and feeling it and largely doing it, right? So during the pandemic, we were consuming 65% goods and 35% services for obvious reasons we couldn't get out and about. As we normalize that pattern and get back to more historic uh, norms like 65% services and 35% goods, you're going to see some shifts and, 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 uh, and some bumps along the way. And, and goods producers are going to see less demand. That's going to help unglue supply chains. But clearly, it's going to put a lot of pressure on service providers. So I think all of that is bundled up into what we're seeing in terms of consumer confidence and consumer spending. And I think the long-term projection is probably good. We've had a, a significant increase of in wages uh, in, on a year-over-year -year basis. And at the same time, we're starting to see incremental uh, decreases in inflationary pressures, and that should continue as well. So if the wage prices stick at the levels that they're at, and, and we see that inflation shows sequential improvement on a month-over-month -month basis throughout the second quarter and second half, I think this consumer is in very good shape and will remain confident. I just think there remains a great deal of pent-up demand for all those things we couldn't do for the last couple of years. Mm. Yeah, and we really miss them. Art, uh, uh, sticking with the comments that Jane Fraser is making, uh, she says that Europe feels more likely to be in recession than the US. Uh, 13 minutes, of course, until we end European equity trading here for this trading day, for this week. Does that feel sensible for you? I mean, a lot of people talk about whether Europe will see a recession this year. Yeah, much more likely if you you know wanted to put a percentage chance on uh, Europe going to recession, I would say it's 2x what it is in the U.S., and we think there's a 30% chance of us going to recession this year. I think a lot of that has to do with its dependence on things coming out of both Russia and Ukraine, whether it's energy product or food, agricultural product, et cetera, and their demographic issues. So I think there's a combination of things that creates a much tougher road for the Eurozone writ large in the, in the year ahead or the next, you know, call it 24 months. Um, we are less dependent on foreign countries for things like food and energy products. So that's a benefit to us. And we continue to have corporations that have strong balance sheets in the U.S. And we continue to have consumers that are very confident and out in spending. Hey, Art, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Art, also very much appreciate your patience. Uh, Art Hogan of B. Riley, National Securities, thank you very much. Let's stay on the job market for a second because it's not all equal. It may be strong, 
But is it all equal? Black unemployment rate actually ticked up to 6.2 percent, despite the overall employment rate staying very low, and that was led by black women. So joining us now is the CEO of executive search firm Barrington Hibbert Associates. Uh, Michael Barrington Hibbert, uh, Hibbert joins us now. Um, Michael, we can talk about how positive the jobs number was, but it's not really positive for everybody. And first of all, thank you for sticking around for us. Um, can you give us some perspective as to what's actually happening on the ground? Alex, well, thanks so much for having me, first and foremost. Look, I think there's three things keeping CEOs awake at night. Clearly, in your news story, the labor market is absolutely fundamental to that. We look at Ukraine and the impact of the energy prices. And also, the third component is supply chain issues. Now, what we have seen pre-pandemic levels is that we have seen an upturn in terms of more black women more Latino women coming into the workforce. Mm -hmm. And that's been based around, fundamentally, around the ability around to work from home. Hmm. That's really interesting, Michael. And so uh, does, that, does that mean there's a, there's a, demogra there's a sort of demographic element to this that it, it will, the impact, if we, if we start to get really into a culture war here, Michael, where there's a whole mm -hmm. argument uh, at the extremes about whether work from home is a good thing or a bad thing, rather than settling around some sort of hybrid and some sort of uh, uh, more complex uh, combination of the two, if it becomes politically polarised, does that, does that have a demographic impact in terms of people's experience of unemployment? Absolutely. And that's a fantastic question, Anna. Look, I think where we are right now, we have seen an over-index since 2020 when corporates, not just across the US, but across Europe, made commitments around black lives and black retention into the workforce. So over the last two years, Anna and Alex, we've seen programs around um, focused specifically around hiring. We've looked at initiatives around coaching, development. And as a consequence, we talk about um, how tight the labor market is. If we look at McKinsey's recent report across professional and financial services, we see at the entry level, 16% of talent going into professional and financial services is black. However, when you look at the exec level, it drops to two and a half percent. So what you now have, mm. you have an abundance, an abundance of corporates after the same talent. So what does that lead? We are in the biggest labor imbalance in terms of supply and demand since World War II. So we're in a situation where we've got corporates going after a very small group in terms of talent. So what we're now seeing, we're seeing wages increase from anything between 2x to 3x at the moment for um, black females and Latino um, females in the US. So we are starting to see a convergent there in terms of demand and supply. Um, that's a really interesting insight, uh, particularly if the pool gets larger because you can now also work from home. And that would also go a little ways to explain the higher unemployment rate. Um, will we see wages rise at the same kind of pace, though? It's a great question. Look, what we're seeing, though, Alex, is people have the option, uh, optionality to deselect from workforces. You've mentioned Egon Musk and his statements in terms of he wants folks back in the office full time. Now, if you're in a small pool of talent, and it's not just around black females, ethnic minorities, but you could be a developer, you could be a, a coder, you've got optionality to go to another organization. So what we're finding now is that skill sets which are in high demand are going to be paid more, but also we're seeing that they're having two or three options available to them. Mm, and I imagine those kind of skills, very valuable across different sectors. Michael, thank you so much for your time. And thanks again for, for sticking around, listening to uh, President Biden talking about the labour market and taking that conversation forward for us. Michael Barrington Hibbert, the CEO of Barrington Hibbert Associates. Uh, now, we need to get to another story still on the US labour market. We talked about Elon Musk a couple of times already this hour. Tesla CEO Elon Musk is aiming for staff cuts of about 10%, noting he had a, quote, super bad feeling about the economy. President 
President Biden was asked about this just a few minutes ago. We heard him uh, wish Elon Musk uh, good luck in his trip to the moon. <laughs> uh, Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow join us, joins us now. We've had a little time to try and digest what it is that, that Elon Musk is saying here because yeah. some of it not entirely clear from this eternal memo, whether he has a bad feeling about the global economy, the US, where he wants to make these cuts and really how serious that is. What was your takeaway? Yeah, I mean, the stock's down 8.5%, so the market's taking it very seriously. You'll remember it's not the first time Musk has raised the question of the state of the global economy. He tweeted seven days ago in response to a question on recession, saying that he did foresee a recession of 12 to 18 months, but that he felt it wasn't necessarily a bad thing because it would only really impact um, companies with weak cash flow. And, you know, the inference being that Tesla has strong cash flow. There are different internal memos doing the rounds. I'd, I'd have to caution that. We haven't verified the second memo, which appears to have gone to a wider group of Tesla employees. But he says in it that jobs relating to battery and vehicle production would be protected. So the layoffs seem to be outside of manufacturing. Tesla is really ballooned over the pandemic period, 100,000 employees globally. So, you know, we're, we're paying attention here. Yeah, um, Ed, to that point, I'm wondering, and I understand we haven't verified it, but is it more of a supply issue or a demand issue? Or just like a constant uh, cost management issue? The, the thing is that uh, you, you wonder why the market's reacting so severely about Elon Musk suggesting that specific job cuts at Tesla are happening. Tesla has been more nimble in the supply chain, right? Yes, it's been supply constrained in that it can't build as many vehicles as it would have hoped on paper at its factories around the world, but it has been able to get parts better than others have. It also had pricing power. And the demand side of this is such an interesting question because they've raised prices multiple times over the pandemic period. Even in the face of very high inflation, they just didn't hesitate. They raised prices. So you do wonder if Elon Musk is also for kind of putting into question the demand side of this equation. Um, let me ask you about other things that are happening in tech then today. Yeah. Stock splits, apparently, Ed. Uh, what's, what's, uh, what's the focus for you? Yeah, so I mean, Amazon's a really interesting one because it's kind of the last in the group, the last of the era of the kind of triple digit stock prices, right? Amazon announced a 24 one stock split in March of this year. The rationale, the market believed the same as Apple and Tesla before it. The stock split makes it more accessible to a broader range of investors, including the, the retail investor. Uh, it's in a significant market event, although the shares basically go back to existing shareholders anyway. Mm. You know, it doesn't it doesn't translate into some massive liquidity event. But yeah, okay. it's one to watch for sure. Ed, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow with uh, from a fairly misty San Francisco. We thank him for joining us. Coming up on the programme, the war in Ukraine hits 100 days. What we have learned, where are we now? What progress is being made on the ground? We will talk to Nina Khrushcheva, Professor of International Affairs at the New School. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Markets, the European close, and we're working our way towards the close of European stocks for this uh, trading day and also for this trading week. Just 15 seconds to go until we close up shop here on European equity markets. Ignore London. The UK market is actually closed today, but we do have activity elsewhere, but it is less activity than we would normally expect to see. Volumes across the stock 600 down by 60% compared to where they would normally be. That is, of course, because we're without London, but that is having a wider impact. Actually, volumes on the DAX down 40% compared to the average there that we normally see. So uh, this is having a, a, an impact that gives you a sense of where people's heads are at or not at today and how much conviction and volume is behind these moves. So we drop a little lower on European markets, not as much as we're seeing over in the United States. Certainly uh, the focus on selling tech stocks in the US, not quite translating uh, directly into the European experience. This is the stock 600 and this is over the past week. So just giving you the context here, it has been a fairly uh, negative period, as you can see, down over the five day period by nine tenths of one percent, a little bit of volatility in there. As we've been reading what the uh, Fed has had to tell us, uh, what the data has had to say, some of the data that's come out this week, if it's been good data, it's led to a negative reaction in risk assets. That seems to be something that uh, has dominated this week. We saw that on Wednesday. We saw that today. We've had a lot of Fed speakers to deal with as well. Let's uh, move on to where we are on the uh, sector picture. And once again, this is the five-day view. So consumer products and services moving higher, up by 2.3%. So we have seen some sectors in positive territory, uh, but only four of them. A lot of negativity, real estate to the 
downside. Travel and leisure moves lower, down by more than 3%. Insurance, utilities and financial services. So most sectors in negative territory. Interestingly, that energy, fairly range-bound. We've had a lot of news flow surrounding energy this week, but it hasn't resulted in much movement in those energy share prices. Let's move on to what's going on with some individual names here in Europe. And I'll start with the banking sector in Germany. Commerce Bank, their biggest shareholder, that is the German government, uh, saying that they're actually open to, uh, to, to selling that stake at some time. They're not going to sell it yet, but soon, uh, when they see some recovery in the share price. And so that's uh, perhaps leading to a little bit of a pop there, up by seven tenths of a percent. And a lot of conversation, actually, in recent weeks about M&A and cross-border, the potential of cross-border M&A. And certainly that always comes up when we talk about the German uh, banking sector, either intra-German M&A and whether they tie up with other big German names or whether cross-border could be the answer. That's uh, an interesting one we will pick up on, no doubt. And then these two co uh, companies I have in here, Alex, in the steel sector, and I think it's interesting that we were talking yesterday about M&A and where we were seeing it and how challenged it was for M&A, for IPOs, for debt raising, for all kinds of corporate uh, or capital markets activity. Well, actually, we do see the odd deal coming up and certainly talk of deals. And these are two businesses, a Spanish one and a Luxembourg-based business. Uh, and they're both talking about some kind of tie-up. Uh, and as a result, we see some share price movement there. Alex? All right, Anna, thanks a lot. Really appreciate that. Um, let's broaden out here to the geopolitical risk picture. Russia's invasion of Ukraine now enters its 100th day today. And according to the UK's Defense Ministry, Russian forces now hold the initiative in Ukraine. Want to get some insight now into where we are with Nina Krusheva, a professor of international affairs at the New School and a senior fellow of the World Policy Institute. And she joins us now. Nina, it's good to get your perspective. What is the end game? What is like a winning look like at this point for both Ukraine and Russia? Well, thank you. Let me start with Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine won in a sense that uh, Kiev, the capital, still holds. Uh, Vladimir Zelensky is a powerful president, powerful war president. Um, and uh, uh, now the Ukrainian unity is we've never seen before like that. So it is a very, very now determined and strong nation in terms of its identity. Um, my fear is that where it ends right now, because Russia does hold a lot of Ukrainian territory now. It, on February 24th, when the operation began, the Donetsk and Luhansk regions, those self-proclaimed republics, uh, the Russian affiliated forces held 13% of that territory. Now it's 75%. There's also two other regions that are um, partially being held by uh, by the Russian forces. And another region, the Kherson region, is also now almost entirely and probably even entirely under the Russian control. So Ukraine did lose a lot of territory. And although it was able to fight much better than anybody expected, and Russians were doing much less well as mm. was expected, it's still, unfortunately, uh, Russia got what it went in to get. That is that Ukrainian territory that Russia claims has always been affiliated with it and was uh, being uh, prosecuted by Ukrainians because the Russian-speaking population was being insulted and, and, uh, and went through genocide and so on. So at this point, I think uh, one needs to take a pause and reassess okay. what the end game and deal in re indeed is. OK, uh, so if we take a pause and reassess 100 days into this terrible war, Nina. Um, what do we, what, what, what signs are we seeing about where this heads to next? Because Ukraine does not want to consider, and we completely understand why, giving up territory. Do you see any solution that does not involve Ukraine giving up territory if we are to see peace? I don't see that solution. In fact, I, I, I must confess, I never, when it all began uh, and we finally got to the point when uh, the war really went on. I never thought that there would be any solution when Ukraine uh, would would not have to give up some of its territorial integrity. I didn't expect it to be. Unfortunately, I didn't expect Ukraine to lose that much, and I'm very concerned about this. So I do think that uh, at this point, the way forward is to get back to the negotiations table and mm -hmm. find out how Ukraine can keep it uh, national sovereignty, even if it have to give up a little bit of territory. It's a very unpopular position, but I'm afraid it's a realistic position because Ukraine already lost 6 million people in immigration, in, in migrants. 
uh, and refugees, and it's already have about over 10 million displaced. It is ha essentially half of its population. And at this point, I think the future of Ukraine, which I think is bright and wonderful, but militarily, at least it cannot be resolved well. So they need to be some sort of peace, uh, ceasefire mm -hmm. and then negotiate. And maybe then uh, some of these parts that Putin, Putin's army was able to take, maybe they could be some sort of negotiation leverage. But I think it, it, the West will be well advised to, um, uh, to talk to President Zelensky about how to, in fact, um, yeah. stop the destruction of the territory of Ukraine. To that point, Nina, uh, I wonder what the Western resolve really is. Um, the West is dealing with an enormous rise of cost of living increase, and it feels like there's been an enormous pivot to many, especially in the U.S., to deal with that. And that sort of puts what's happening in Ukraine on their back burner. And I wonder how you see the unity of the West the longer this drags on. And that is my fear, and we already hear that the unity is breaking here and there, uh, and they've been, you know, I mean, let's remember that despite all the sanctions and everything, Russia still gets uh, $800 million a day uh, in its oil and gas exports. So that's something that feeds that army, and this is really, Europe particularly is not ready to give it up, and even if Europe does give it up, there's still plenty of markets that Russia can tap in despite all the sanctions and, and whatnot. So resolve is slightly breaking, uh, and uh, that is unfortunate. That's why I think this is now the time to somehow to negotiate, because Putin is, I think Putin is relying on the war of attrition. He does believe that the West has a very short attention span, and, you know, let's be fair, it does. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, ultimately the uh, the consumers are, uh, consumers are going to be very upset with what's going on. And so all this resolve will, will be more in political slogans than, uh, mm. uh, than reality. And I think this is something that needs to be taken into consideration. And I do want to say that Boris Johnson, I think at this point, doing Ukraine a disservice because he's looking for his, uh, you know, what is the final hour, uh, the Churchillian right. moment when he saves Ukraine. But it's no longer saving Ukraine. It's it's actually uh, it's actually inflicting more wounds on on its territory as it stands now. I was actually going to ask you about, about that very thing because we just heard pre from President Biden. He was uh, doing a press conference and he was asked actually about whether Ukraine would have to give up any territory. He said he would let Ukraine decide that. It's for, for Ukraine to decide, not him, and he would support them for as long as they want to go. But he did, certainly didn't have quite the, the level of rhetoric that we've heard from the UK Prime Minister. Uh, I mean, uh, Boris Johnson famously telling Bloomberg just a couple of weeks ago that you can't negotiate with Putin, calling him a crocodile and saying you can't negotiate someone who is chewing your left leg uh, in reference hmm. in the way that he does to the war. I mean, how can Ukraine come to a negotiating table when we see the images of the destruction in eastern Ukraine? Well, and it's, you know, and, and it's fine. I mean, it's all this political rhetoric, uh, which is, you know, f fine. It's still, I mean, we are not watching a Hollywood movie, and that's very unfortunate uh, because all these things are good on, on, on screen, but these are, you know, real people going through this. And, yes, it's very difficult to negotiate with Putin, but as, let's, uh, let's remember that, for example, Europeans, and, of course, the Anglo-Saxon world says, well, you know, they're horses and they've been, you know, trying to appease Putin, look what happened, maybe. But they've been, in fact, very adamant that, you know, insults are not going to work because exactly there would be a moment when uh, Ukraine really should not, lose, should not lose more territory. And I think it's interesting that Biden has been saying uh, that uh, now they have to, you know, rely on Ukraine to make those decisions, which is true true, because only until recently uh, the Biden administration was saying, well, it's, you know, full defeat for Putin. But it's all, once again, wonderful in rhetoric. How do they really see the full defeat for Putin? What do they mean? The, uh, the palace coup hasn't happened. He may be sick. There was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of rumors about it. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, uh, we, see, mm. we don't see, I mean, we can't see any protests in the street because people are immediately snatched away from any possible uh, opposition to this, as the Russians call it, the Kremlin calls it special operation. So how do they see it happen? And so, and the war is going on, and we just don't want it to become a forever war, become another yeah. long-term frozen conflict, and we'll be talking about it for many more years to come. Mm.
Uh, professor, thank you so much for joining us. Nina Khrushcheva, the uh, professor thank at you. the New School and a senior fellow at the World Policy Institute. From geopolitics back to the markets briefly just to check on European stocks then uh, through the settlement period here in Europe and uh, as we head to a short break we see that European stocks are are off but actually coming off their their lows of earlier we see the DAX down two tenths of one percent the broader picture uh, for European stocks down two tenths of one percent on pretty low volumes though Alex of course because the UK is still closed today yeah volume a touch lighter here as well the Nasdaq 100 still up by 2.6 percent but off the lows of the session all right coming up we're going to talk about airlines and the bidding war for Spirit so shares for the budget airline down after one of its suitors Frontier Group sweetened its offer the whole sector getting hit today Spirit CEO uh, Ted Christie will be joining us next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets, a European close. I'm Ritika Gupta. You're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Nancy Davis, the Quadratic Capital CIO. That's at 3.30 p.m. in New York. This is Bloomberg. All right, well, Frontier is sweetening the terms of its takeover offer for Spirit Airlines. The news today is the ultra-discount carrier has won support from a key proxy advisory firm that gave it some new momentum as it tries to fend off a hostile bid by JetBlue Airways. Joining us now for more on this is Spirit CEO Ted Christie. Ted, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, at the heart of this deal is you get JetBlue higher bid in cash, Frontier cash in stock, lower bid. You guys choose Frontier, maybe less regulatory hurdles there. What the new amendment that has just passed that Frontier is actually going to help a reverse termination fee. That was kind of the sweetener today. Um, do you think it's enough to woo shareholders? Uh, thanks for having me on. Good morning. Uh, I do think it's enough. Uh, a couple of points of, uh, of interest and clarity there. First, you're right. They, we did restructure the deal with Frontier to include uh, a reverse termination fee. We had heard from um, the proxy advisory services, ISS, that that was something that they wanted to see. Uh, and so we were able to negotiate that in. Our deal with Frontier is largely a stock deal. Um, and so while there's some confusion about the value of the difference between uh, JetBlue and Frontier, we think it's clear that we, we want our shareholders to participate in the upside, the return of normalcy uh, for the industry, as well as the synergies in the deal. And that's why we think it's actually quite a compelling um, equity transaction. And with this reverse termination fee, we think we've solved um, some of the concerns that were out there. Um, why do you feel like it took the ISS report that actually recommended Spirit shareholders reject the Frontier Agreement, though, to get this latest concession from Frontier? Yeah, I think that's right. They, they, they were clear in that report that, um, that, in their opinion, they felt that a reverse termination fee was something that was needed in the transaction. The structure of our regulatory approval process between us and Frontier was more of a partnership at the time, which was why we didn't have one to begin with, but we just changed that. Um, and now we have the, the reverse termination fee, and we think that satisfies their concerns. So I hear what you're saying in terms of that it's mostly stock versus a cash deal and that shareholders need to understand uh, the benefits of the frontier deal. However, we are headed into an uncertain environment and, poten and potentially a recessionary threat. Are you worried that a certainty of a cash deal from JetBlue is more appealing to shareholders as we're transitioning into a more uncertain time and Frontier shares have fallen 25%. Test, test. Well, one thing that's important to note, it's difficult for us to assess any um, proposal from JetBlue right now because what we've told them is that the regulatory hurdle is too high. And in, in many respects, a very difficult one for them to, a narrative for them to tell. And so we gave them in some feedback and some instructions on ways they could actually turn it into a, a more manageable deal from the regulatory perspective, and they simply have not done that. And so the bid itself is, is illusory because it can't be um, consummated. So we think that the equity deal with Frontier is a very attractive deal. That's what's on the table for our shareholders is to vote on that next week. And we encourage them to vote for because it's better than our standalone plan. Mm. 
Uh, good to see you, Ted. It's Anna here in London. So away from the deal, away from the specifics of this deal, thinking about your operating environment more generally right now, how uh, nervous are you about the fall and the winter compared to what will, I assume, be a pretty strong summer season? T tell me about the disconnect we might see between the summer and later on in the year. You're right, we're, we're seeing fantastic demand right now, um, really unprecedented demand uh, over the last decade or more. Uh, as people start to return to the skies and, and enjoy travel again. Um, and there's nothing right now that would tell me that that wouldn't continue into the fall and into the winter of the year. Um, there, is, there is significant untapped demand returning to the market. And the challenge that the airlines have faced is actually getting enough capacity deployed uh, to meet that demand. Uh, we're actually larger than we were uh, pre-pandemic right now, and we expect to continue to march towards an even bigger airline towards the end of the year. And we're seeing really positive demand indications um, that people not only are ready to return to travel, but they're making different buying decisions. They're, they're more apt to buy experiences like travel than they are physical goods. Mm. And so that's actually quite a generational shift as well. How tight is the labor market for you at Spirit right now, Ted? Certainly in Europe, this is a really big talking point, both for airlines and also for airports. We've seen all kinds of cancellations over this uh, current holiday period that we're in here in, uh, in the UK and some of that in Europe as well, in the rest of Europe as well. What's the US, what's the Spirit story around difficulty getting hold of labor at this point? Well, that was definitely uh, a story last year uh, as we were coming out of um, the Delta wave uh, for um, you know, for the virus, it was becoming a challenge to to find the people to start to add the capacity back into the market. But we've largely solved those issues um, and have ramped up our hiring and our training to meet what we think is this you know robust return of demand. Uh, but it's going to take us a while to do to get you know to move all the logistics to get us to where we want to be, and we think we'll be closer uh, to where we want to be by the end of this year. So the good news is there are people applying. Uh, we we have tons of applications for across the system, uh, and we just need to get them all trained and online. And what kind of uh, fuel prices are you preparing yourself for, uh, Ted? Jet fuel prices? Are you preparing for higher jet fuel prices from here? Well, we're, we're, we're absolutely seeing it right now. I mean, um, very, very high jet fuel. It's, um, it's eating into the economic recovery on the demand side. Uh, thankfully, we do have plenty of demand to help, um, to help trigger some of the revenue that we need to offset that, but it is a frustrating number. The good news about a carrier like Spirit is we're just simply more efficient than the larger network airlines because we have more seats on our airplane, which makes it more of a carpool. So the, the, in and of itself, it's more efficient. And we operate one of the youngest fleets in the world, which are generally more efficient. In fact, the newest variant of our aircraft is 15% more fuel efficient than the prior variant. And so while it is frustrating across the board, we're actually positioned better than most because of those factors. Ted, thanks so much for joining us. Spirit Airlines CEO Ted Christie joining us to talk about the deal for the business and also the broader operating environment. More on the markets when we come back. This is Bloomberg. Well, U.S. stocks right around the lows of the session after that stronger than expected uh, jobs forecast uh, report. Uh, Abigail Doolittle is tracking some of those moves. Light volume, though, but still, we're trading very heavy. We are trading very heavy, and it's interesting, Alex. Into today, stocks had been poised for an up week. Now we are looking at a down week for U.S. stocks. This is a weekly chart of the major indexes here in the U.S., and you can see much of this year to the downside and, therefore, the bear market in many of these markets, including the NASDAQ 100, the Russell 2000, the S&P 500 had briefly topped touch that territory. Last week, of course, we had this big, big rally, but not so much this week. And again, into today, stocks were poised to be higher, but now we're looking at roughly 1% losses or slightly less than that range. Taking a look at some of the stocks on the move on the day, we're going to see what's going on here. And of course, much of it has to do with Tesla and Elon Musk's feelings about the economy, a super bad feeling about the economy that 
job hiring at Tesla is on pause right now. Uh, and of course, the idea that there could be a 10% job cut, that would be more than 10,000 workers at that EV maker. And you can see this is really taking down some of the other electric vehicle companies. We see Lucid, Rivian, and Fisker all down sharply. And Tesla, of course, a big weight to both the NASDAQ 100 and the S&P 500, among other, uh, other indexes. But his comments really reiterating or underlining, underscoring uh, what Jamie Dimon said about a, a hurricane, John Walden of Goldman Sachs talking about a, a possible rough patch here. So we do see this bearish move here for these stocks. Now we do have one sector higher on the day that of course is energy. We have Occidental Petroleum off of its highs actually, but still up nearly about seven tenths of 1%. ConocoPhillips up 1.6%. But when oil rises as it is, that of course uh, weighs on the airline. So you can see that American Airlines down 7.5%, United Airlines down 4.4%. And this of course has to do with uh, Alex. It has to do with the fact that uh, American Airlines, similar to Delta and United, uh, said that the revenue is going to be better, but that capacity is down. So airlines down too. Yep. Absolutely. Abigail, thanks a lot, Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle joining us there. Hey, Anna, thank you very much, by the way, for anchoring the last couple days. It's been a pleasure, and that wraps it up uh, for me and Anna here on television. Coming up, though, a former Council of Economic Advisors Chair Laura Tyson will be joining Balance of Power with David Weston on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Bloomberg.